Hi guys, so uh, April 23rd, 2020, um, it happens to be Shakespeare's birthday, so I went ahead and put a meme of Shakespeare on there because I love Shakespeare. Uh, the meme says, think he has no swag, invented the word. Um, Shakespeare is credited with inventing hundreds or maybe even possibly thousands of words. So the word that he probably created was m probably closer to a swagger, which is like when somebody walks uh, confidently or arrogantly and they have that air about them that just like they have that swag. Uh, and then it got shortened out over the time or over different periods and it became to mean something different for you guys in a different generation. But yeah, so today's his birthday. Um, we're covering one concept today, uh, internal and external challenges to state power. So we're going to look at how different states, different empires um, had to deal with internal problems. So problems within their own empire and then external problems, problems outside that they pretty much had no control over. So um, the essential question is going to be looking at how they dealt with them during this specific time period from 1450 to 1750. Uh, the very first one that we're going to talk about is called uh, Metacom's War, or also known as uh, AKA F King Philip's War. And there's a reason for that. Metacom is the guy that you see up there. He adopted the Christian name Philip. Um, Metacom's ancestor, uh, I want to say his grandfather, was very uh, key and instrumental to assisting the first... Uh, Pilgrims, Puritans that came off of the Mayflower. Um, and so the connections between his tribe and his people um, have, have been around or were around at least at that time for a while. But uh, Medicum's War um, is an external war because basically what it is is that it's the final effort of the indigenous people, the native people, to try and push Great Britain out of New England. Um, some natives, like the Mohegan and the Pequot, actually sided with the English because they felt that it would be in their favor. They kind of knew or had a sense that the English were going to win anyway, and so they would rather have been on the winning side than be on the losing side. And so yes, at one point these Indians did choose the enemy versus their own people um, because it would have worked out better in their favor. It, what it ended is that it ended with the subjugation of the Wampanoag people. Um, and if that name sounds familiar, Wampanoag is the tribe um, that had the original or the first Thanksgiving. Then you have the Fronde Rebellion, which is an internal rebellion that happened and occurred in France. You had nobles whose power was being threatened uh, and weakened. They eventually began to rebel against the king, uh, King Louis XIV. Louis XIV was the one that basically, uh, like I told you guys before, created Versailles to keep an eye on the nobles. Um, and he uh, was very successful at it because the nobles were not victorious at all. They actually lost um, and they uh, their power ended up even becoming even weaker, which is going to lead later to further problems causing the French Revolution eventually. Then you have the Maratha Rebellion, which happens in Mughal India. This one is also internal because what's going to happen is that since India is a pretty complex nation, or Mughal India at least, if you go back and remember from our other conversations and our other lessons, um, Mughal India was conquered by one of the Islamic gunpowder empires. Um, and so the fact, though, uh, I know it's kind of confusing, I, I ramble, I apologize, but um, India itself is, the majority of it is made up of Hindu or people who practice the Hindu faith and religion. And then you have an Islamic empire coming in and conquering and taking over. So you are going to have a conflict of faith, a conflict of politics, a conflict of society, lots of conflict just happening in general. And so this one is going to be an internal one because eventually what's going to happen is that a Hindu warrior group is going to rise up against many of these Mon uh, Mughal leaders who happen to be Islamic or Muslim. They eventually are going to be victorious and successful, and they're going to create the Maratha Empire, which defeated and ended the Mughal Empire. Some other challenges to state power, you have the Pueblo Revolt, which was Spain versus Mexico. Uh, this is external. Do not confuse this with the Battle of Puebla. This is different. Puebla is going to come later. Puebla is with Father Miguel Hidalgo, the guy that does the Grito, why we celebrate um, 16 de Septiembre, something totally different. This is way before then, so do not confuse it. This is Pueblo, not Puebla. So the Pueblo Revolt uh, is Spain versus Mexico. Like I said, external. Um, the indigenous natives were upset, obviously, um, that Spain was dominating or controlling their territory or their regions in their area, and they were tired of being not even second-class citizens. They were considered beneath that. Um, the Spaniards had a very elaborate social system. You had peninsulares who were at the very, very top. Peninsular meant that you were European blooded 100%, and you also were born in Europe, and you were at the top of that social group. Then you had criollos or creoles, uh, in a way, which were 100% European-blooded, 
but you were born in the Americas. So even there was a distinction between the two groups, people born in Europe and people born in the Americas, despite the fact that they shared 100% European blood. Underneath that, you had the mestizos, which was a mixture of Indians and Europeans. And then way, way, way at the bottom, you had the indigenous people who were pretty much equivalent to the same thing as slaves. And so obviously there was uh, a lot of maltreatment and mistreatment going on for these people. Initially, they were successful. They killed about 400 Spaniards and they managed to push them out of the region. The problem that happened is that the um, Criollos, who had originally sided with the Indians, um, are going to get blamed for a lot of the problem and a lot of the violence and they're going to flip sides in the war. And so eventually the Spaniards are going to be able to reconquer the territory or reconquer the area in 1692. Um, you have the Haitian Revolution, which is also an external one. Um, Haitian slaves rebelled against the French Empire. So Haiti was um, a country that had been colonized by the French. Uh, some notable things to, note to remember about the Haitian Revolution is that it's the only successful slave revolution. Out of all the revolutions that ever occurred in history, it's the only one that actually ha has a victory for the people who are trying uh, to overcome or trying to create um, the abolition of slavery as far as an entire nation goes um, at that time. Um, you have famous General Toussaint Louverture. There's a picture of him there. He's kind of holding a letter. Who becomes a hero of the revolution? He was a former slave, um, self-educated, and then became a very important military leader. Toussaint was very, very trusting. He believed the French. Um, and when the French kind of sent word that they wanted to have an agreement, have a meeting, sit down with him and kind of come to terms, he, he arranged for passage to go to France, and the minute he goes to France, he's arrested, put in jail, and then he's killed. Um, the long-term effects of that, or actually, I should say the short-term effects of that, is going to be that Toussaint's successor was not as understanding and not as kind um, as Toussaint was, and used um, Louverture's uh, assassination or murder, basically, to be the driving force behind the rebellion, behind the revolution. And Haiti is actually going to become the first independent state that is free from slavery, but it's also going to be the first state that is ruled by non-whites and former captives. Um, some other challenges to power, you have resistant, uh, resistance, resistance uh, to Portugal and Africa, and again, this one is also external. Um, you have an African ruler named Ana Nzinga. She aligned herself originally with Portugal to try and protect her people and protect her kingdom from neighboring tribes and the slave trade. So she was one of those groups that I talked about yesterday where she thought that if she could make a deal with them that her people would be safe, her people would be protected. And they were up to a certain point until... Um, the Portuguese continuously needed slaves to go work in the plantations. And so after a certain point, this agreement that they had was considered null and void and her people were being attacked. So this alliance falls apart. Uh, Ana Nzinga eventually flees west and she establishes a, a location known as Matamba. There she would incite a rebellion. She would align herself with the Dutch and she freed many uh, runaway, it should be slaves, there's a typo, my, uh, my mistake. Um, and then she actually resisted uh, Portuguese rule for decades um, in Nodongo, in this territory, in this area, with the help of the Dutch. So she was a very well-revered woman. She's a lady at the very, very top. Um, then you have resistance in Russia. That happens to be internal. Um, in Russia, the nobles were growing very, very powerful. These are the boyars. Uh, after wars had weakened the Russian government. There was, there was some internal conflict um, with the monarchy that was going on. Um, you have Catherine the Great, who is pictured there in the middle. She is suspected of murdering her husband. Um, she becomes queen. She uh, was married to Peter the Great. He, um, or sh she overthrows him, and then he's imprisoned, and then he dies. Uh, and then she becomes Empress of Russia. Uh, but people were really mistrusting of her originally because when she was very, very young, she was married off to Peter. She was from Germany. Uh, people didn't like the fact that she was an outsider, but she completely assimilated. She converted to the Russian Orthodox Church. She spoke the Russian language. She considered herself a Russian and she adopted the culture and everything. She was a very, very well-educated woman. Um, she wanted to be seen as an equal towards men, which was a threat to men who were in power. Um, Catherine actually was one of the first ones to inoculate herself with the smallpox vaccine. Um, smallpox was still an issue at the time and uh, the doctors had created a vaccine to see if they could combat this disease and many people were afraid of, of being um, infected with it because basically when you have a vaccine you're infecting yourself or you're putting a small portion of the actual disease in your body to see if your body can fight off those other 
pathogens. I'm trying to think of the word, but yeah, they're trying to fight it off. And um, so you would have to basically inject yourself with a small amount of smallpox. And because she didn't want her people to be afraid, she herself had her, her uh, or was vaccinated. Um, and she survived. So it actually helped encourage the people of Russia to go out and get vaccinated as well. Um, so going back to the situation at hand and the rivalry and the rebellion. So the thing with Russia is that for a very long time, the social hierarchy didn't change. Yes, they had this internal rebellion where the kings and the queen were fighting against each other, but as far as everybody else goes, they stayed the same on the social ladder, and that didn't really sit well because the, the serfs, who are essentially, again, slaves, are at the very, very bottom. They're taxed extremely high. They're tied to the land, and it was a continued practice that ended even long after Europe had ended it. Um, England had ended it. Uh, France had ended slavery. Uh, but uh, Russia would continue it all the way up until the 1800s. So it was a very long-lasting institution in this country. You're going to have a rebellion that becomes famous known as Pugachev's Rebellion. Pugachev was a guy that actually tried to pass himself off as Peter the Great. Uh, because if you're a, a peasant, uh, you're not at court, you don't see or read books, you don't see paintings, and so you don't really know what these royal people look like. Um, and so he was able to pass himself off for a while kind of as an imposter and then uh, he got a lot of support from a group of people called Cossacks. We talked about them. These are basically kind of like um, militia or peasant warriors. They're very strong. They're very brutish. They're kind of bullies and they were challenging Catherine's power. They didn't want her to be in power. Uh, Catherine did have a son and so they wanted this son to kind of take over her position because obviously if there's a male that's capable of fulfilling this role, then the male should be in charge. Um, the only thing was that she felt that her son was not fit to rule. Catherine uh, would actually use her armies uh, and she would use one of her favorite generals to put down this entire rebellion. And it's actually going to work in her favor because she's going to use it to become even more powerful in her kingdom. Some other challenges to power um, occur in the Caribbean. Um, this one is external, so you're going to have slaves in the Caribbean that were fighting uh, to gain their freedom. These are going to be known as the Maroon Wars. The lady that you guys see at the top, she is known as Queen Nanny. She is very, very scary. She's got a machete in her hands. Um, she was basically the leader of uh, these runaway slaves who were um, fighting for their independence. They wanted their freedom from these colonized areas or colonized territories. Um, and m some of them would be successful, so they would gain their success or they would gain their independence from uh, these settlements that had originally uh, tried to colonize them in the beginning. England. Um, England is going to be an internal one as well. So England is going to go through a period of time with known as the Glorious Revolution. It's called the Glorious Revolution because it's a bloodless revolution. Uh, no blood is spilled, nobody dies, uh, and there's a reason for that. So. Um, you have the Catholic James II of England, who was an anti-Protestant, which made people uneasy and angered. So I'm going to do a quick, like really quick as much as I can. So Henry VIII was Catholic. Um, England had been Catholic for 1,500 years. Remember, he wanted a divorce from his wife. The Pope wouldn't give it to him. He created his own church, the Anglican Church, the Protestant Church, and separated from the Catholic Church forever. Okay, Henry dies. The throne passes to his son. Edward, who is a Protestant, uh, he dies after six years. The crown passes to his daughter, Mary, who is a Catholic, super hardcore Catholic. They called her Bloody Mary because she killed people or she bur had people burned at the stake for not being Catholic. So England goes back to being Catholic. Uh, then she dies after six years. And then Elizabeth becomes queen for like 60 years and she's Protestant. Cool. All right. Elizabeth has no children. So then the crown passes to James, her um, great nephew, I want to say. Um, it was the um, son of her cousin, uh, Mary Queen of Scots. James I was born a Catholic, baptized a Catholic, but raised a Protestant. Um, and so then James I becomes king. After James I, he has a son, Charles I. Charles I really angered a lot of the English people, and he's the one that actually ends up losing his head. James II is the brother of James I, because James I didn't have any children. So when they were young, James uh, and Charles I had to leave England because it wasn't safe for them. Uh, and so they left uh, and they came back eventually. But when they came back, um, it, uh, how do I say it? The situation really didn't get any better. Charles, 
Charles II was known as the Merry Monarch because he did make a lot of changes in England, but people still secretly thought he was um, a closet Catholic. He just didn't advertise it to everybody else. James, when he becomes king, is not shy at it ab about it at all. He's very, very anti-Protestant. He is a very staunch Catholic, and people are afraid that he's going to just reverse everything again. So um, instead, there's a plot to overthrow him. The Protestants invited his nephew, which also happens to be his son-in-law, um, William of Orange, who was a prince of Holland or the Netherlands, um, and his wife Mary II, which was the daughter of James, uh, to invade England. Um, basically what that means is uh, James's daughter and her husband would overthrow her father to become the king and queen of England, and it was with the support of the um, parliament that they were able to do this. So it, it, it happens very, very easy. James knows that he's not popular, that he's not well-liked, and he almost flees immediately. He goes to France where he spends the rest of his life and hiding out, essentially. So yes, called the Glorious Revolution because no one died in the process. So the Royal House of Stuart or the House of Stuart, you can hear Ariel. Um, like I mentioned, it's a little complicated. So you did have James I who inherited the kingdom after Elizabeth, uh, son Charles I, that's the one that's executed. When he is executed, his wife, uh, Henri, um, uh, Henriette Marie, takes the children to different places. Um, Holland, France, uh, other countries that are going to provide them safety. So you have Charles and you have James II. Um, they were brothers. Uh, Charles didn't have any surviving legitimate children, so that's why the crown passes to his brother and not to his children. If you can see from that family tree, William and Mary are first cousins. Um, they themselves also do not have any children, so when uh, Mary dies, the crown passes to her other sister, Anne. Um, so it's a very, very complicated history, but basically England was dealing with a lot of internal issues, and they've been dealing with a lot of internal issues since Henry VIII's break with the Catholic Church. Okay, last slide, this is just for you to review, um, and this is just kind of a quick summary and a quick overview of basically what I talked about and the important things. So if you wanted to study this, this might be better. If you need to go back and look at the notes to remember what I talked about, um, whichever one works easier for you. Your exit ticket, I, if you notice I'm trying to give you guys less work because I do want you guys to catch up and I do guys want you to focus um, on your assignments, you are going to have a modified rubric again uh, for tomorrow, Friday. Um, so make sure that you um, log in at the correct time. Um, it's at 11 a.m. for the timed writing DBQ. Your responses must be in essay format. A lot of the responses that I got back were really, really short paragraphs. They need to be essays, guys. So it means it needs to have an introduction. It needs to have body paragraphs. You either submit a Word document, you either write it out by hand, and you send me snapshots, and you upload it to Google Classroom. Some tips. Your job when you're looking at writing a DBQ is to remember that you're trying to earn as many points as possible. So some of the easiest ways to earn points is writing a thesis. That's one point. That's a sentence. Context, that's the who, what, when, where, why. That's also a point. Those two things go in your introduction. The evidence from four documents, you're going to have more than four documents, but you only have to use four. Um, and so that's uh, three points. Then HIP, you get two points if you use it three times. And then outside information, if you use two different kinds of uh, outside pieces of information, you also get two points. So these are the easiest ones. If you need to go back and look at the modified rubric, go back and look at the modified rubric and make sure that you guys are uh, aware of how many points you can earn per category. Again, if you have any questions, um, call me, email me, let me know. Hope you guys are doing well. And then don't forget you guys have a DBQ uh, tomorrow. Adios.